towards the end, just to like talk about anything that comes to mind um, around our event tonight. Um, I'm an illustrator, as you know, it's always been my side hustle. <laughs> um, I've worked in engineering for the last five years, and then before that I was in economics for five years. I didn't study art, I'm self-taught, so I guess I'll go over a little bit of that tonight. So it's one of my pleasures in life as a curator. I'm a usually a design curator and an architectural historian. And it's one of my absolute pleasures in life to get to talk to artists about their process. Um, and so I have questions for Kat. We've done, um, you are, I have to say, by far the most attentive audience that we've had because you're also the oldest one <laughs> in any of our book reviews so far. Um, although they, the others have been really fantastic. Um, but this one was really exciting for me at least because it allows me actually to ask wow. questions that I don't even know the answer to, Kat. I deliberately didn't ask you about them before tonight. Um, and to really delve into your process as an artist. I got to write the words for this book, but um, it's only a beautiful book because of the work that it really has you who made it in so many ways. So I wanted to start with the day when you got the email from Momo. It wasn't me that sent it, it was um, a colleague of mine who was in the publications department. And um, it, I think, I mean, I don't actually even know what it said because I wasn't copied on it, but I think it said something along the lines of, would you illustrate a book about the rainbow flag for Momo? Can you describe that moment? Yeah, so um, I was sitting at my desk at Apple at the time, and I was an engineering technician. I The day before, I had got re gotten rejected by the one MFA program that I applied to, <laughs> <laughs> which is at Carnegie Mellon, yeah. and only accepts six people. So like I remember talking this over with my therapist at the time. I would you apply to a program for six people, and I was like, I don't know, I just like really wanted to write an essay. <laughs> I was actually like, I would take the Apple bus to work from the mission every day, and then that commute was like an hour and a half each way, and I would write an essay saying like how much I, like, basically I was like angry about the commute, and like, like expressing a lot of that anger and resentment in my application essay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I see the scene being said. Yeah. So, so the next day, I got this, email that said the subject line, the rainbow flag. Um, I, I was like on my lunch break and checking my Gmail account. And then as I read through the email, like it was signed off by someone from the Museum of Modern Art and they invited me to illustrate or to miss sample work for this book project. So first off, I was just floored. And I was like at my desk and I was like, <laughs> like freaking out. Um, so it was just beyond belief that something like this could come my way. And before then, I had just like posted work to Instagram and maybe had 12 people like it. I would keep posting work and then maybe like 20 people liked it. <laughs> and then I kept posting work and then eventually like maybe 100 people liked my stuff and then out of nowhere, like Michelle like found my work. I actually don't know a lot of history around how you found my work. Yeah, so I was, um, as with any kind of research project, I usually make a PowerPoint. And um, I make a very long PowerPoint. So, for example, I did an exhibition on fashion and clothing, and it was like hundreds of slides long. I would look at um, you know different research avenues and really pull as much as I could. Sometimes over three or four years for a project. And so for this one, um, and we'll get to how when we came to do the Rainbow Flag project in a, in a minute. But for this one, I knew that I could invite an illustrator to illustrate this project. And so I pulled together a PowerPoint of maybe 80 or 90 people that I found either books that I knew um, or you know books that I hadn't known before but I found online. I did it over about two months, which was held as long as it took to convince our publisher, Chris Hudson, at MoMA um, that we should have this as a book. And Kat, I found you work I was looking online. And I, I used Instagram, but I also was looking at illustrators who um, lived and worked in San Francisco. I thought it important to have a, a representation of people who um, were from this particular city and um, knew the city as well. Mm -hmm. And so out of all of them, you were my first choice. And so I was really excited when you emailed back and said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you say yes? Um, so I, 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 as someone who wants to make art full time, like I care, I obviously care about cost, and it's expensive to live here. Like I keep my day job because it, it's important for me to not stress about how, what it's like to live here. Um, I had to say yes to this because the biggest project I had at the time was like something like was like small stuff for friends, which I really love. But this project is just extremely visible, 
And to have something like a museum of modern art and to be of this subject material and for children, I think that felt like a lifetime opportunity. Really. And I, I knew like in the back of my mind that there was a lot of work to make a project like this even happen. Because if, if you look at the other books that MoMA has, a lot of them are about very obscure and niche like art topics, like maybe artists that aren't very well known. So this was the first MoMA publicated, like published book. Um, about something very accessible that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And and after reading the book to kids, like kids really love rainbows. They don't care about Yeah, there's so many politics. Like well, you'll learn tonight that there was a lot of politics about authorship of the flag. Yeah. Um, but kids really love like with the like glitter and sequins, <laughs> which are like so it's just like they like I, I think it's just such an honor to be working on something that people can relate to. So I had to say yes. I actually um, waited for my MoMA contract to come through, and I remember it was like mid October, and that was exactly the year at which I finished my job at Apple. So then I put in my two weeks' notice, and then pursued this book full time for about a month. And then I was picked up by my current company, Samsara. I have some coworkers here tonight. Um, and then they live a mile from my apartment. So I was like, okay, I can I can like commute a mile now and work on the book. And I interviewed with that company saying, like, I'm working on this book project. It's really important that I have time for it. So I would spend like maybe like I would take four-day weekends every so often to, to finish the project. And it would take me a day to like get in the right mindset. Yeah. And then really I wouldn't make work that I was happy about until maybe Sunday night, and then I'd have to go back to work on Monday. And that was something that really blew me away, Kat, because so we didn't actually meet in person until the book was done. So we did a lot of emailing and a lot of Skyping, but yeah. not in person. And so I actually didn't even know Kat was an engineer until I met her in person. I was like, wait, what? And now that you months ago. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And you also have like degrees in economics. That's insane. You're an, an, an economics person, and then yeah. an engineer, and then this. And I think it was testament in many ways to the remote um, going back and forth. And also, my understanding of you now and then too was your primary identity for me was as an illustrator. And I, I was a curator. That was how I had first come to know you. And that's how I think of you primarily too. Yeah, although you have these amazing other things that you yeah, do. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on that as an artist. That's so extremely important to have some sort of presence through an audience that can't see you or hasn't ever met you. I mean, it's an art career is like really the art should speak for itself. Like I think the identity of the individual, depending on the artist, like it's either like Andy Warhol stuff is hugely like he's it's all about him. But for me to have some sort of like just to take up space in your mind mm -hmm. as like an artist is just like really what I hope for. Mm -hmm. That like you don't maybe care about like who I am, but that like you feel something, you see what I mean. And that for me was absolutely what happened. I saw your work, and there are many other illustrators whose work I still really love in that PowerPoint, and it would be lovely to have a book made by at some point. But there were just a few images that I saw on your Instagram feed where I was like, I wonder where that could go further. Like I'd like to see more of that. Well, and um, there were, and I just felt like MoMA is this machine. I worked for that museum for about four years, and it's um, I call it very affectionately the Wall Street of museums. It's an extremely corporate space um, for an art space, and so I thought if we were going to do a book like this, it would be way more interesting for it to be. Um, a first-time illustrator and a first-time bookmaker, rather than to go to somebody who was either expected or who had done this a million times over. And so I really love that you came at it with a super fresh perspective. Yeah, and then on my side, like, it's it's such a dream to have the commissioner, like, completely trust your work. So people never told me, like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, why did you, there were, I remember actually, you'll see later, like, pictures from my storyboard, but I sent them one illustration, and, like, they were sort of like, we don't get what's happening in this country. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle was like, I, just, I sort of like its weirdness. <laughs> but that's, like, <laughs> that's, that's absolutely my job to be like, no, it's the artist's vision, just deal with it. Or like, wait, wait, it's going to be okay, like, just trust. Because I think as soon as you don't feel like somebody trusts you, then you yeah. start to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. myself. Yeah, I mean, so you just need to have someone say, no, like continue, like let's see where it's going. And there are moments I've worked with commissions where 
just get so far down the road and you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. I trusted you, but I just needed to like rein in. And so I always my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, my job as a curator is to be like a really friendly uh, water colleague in a way. To like keep on everything, but not actually touch the, the sheet. Yeah, and I think I, I have so much freedom to practice what I wanted, and I think that was just like, I don't know that how often that happens. Because I, 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 I shared a studio with four other women in, in West Oakland before I like, before I started working in the South Bay, and we would talk shop all the time about like what their like work was like. And there's a joke I like to say, which is like when you put a bunch of bankers together um, in conversation, like they always talk about art. But then when you put a bunch of artists together, they always talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> and they would all talk about how much they had to hustle to cover rent. Yeah. And I so respect that. And for me, that's just a choice I've decided to not do. But they would say like how they, they, they were doing a mural, for instance, and like someone was like, oh my god, they want me to like do this style that I did like two years ago. And like, I don't do that anymore. Or they'll be like, can you do this thing and this thing and this thing? And it's like, no, you can't do like three different things yeah. in one piece. It's very hard. Yeah. And also like, uh, can you just let me have a commission and if you open rather than tell me what to do? Because yeah. if you know it that clearly, then do it yourself. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strange relationship and it's dictated, I think, by different institutions. I think the great thing about this was kind of like bringing the flag into the museum, which we did in 2015 as one of the... Um, uh, so uh, something, works. I, I wasn't clear on this, is it the real flag? No, no, it's not, and deliberately not. So MoMA has a design collection that is um, great for European and American design. It's founded as a museum in 1929, and so great as a design collection of European and American makers mostly um, from the 1910s onwards. And it has either um, mass-produced work or um, prototypes. Um, but it doesn't ever really deal with, um, it does have some textiles, but it doesn't usually deal with quote unquote craft. Um, and so when we knew that we would bring the flag in, we um, purchased one from Gilbert's site. We worked directly with the place that was uh, making them on mass. But we didn't bring in one of the very first um, flags. Uh, in fact, that they, I don't think he had an idea of what they were. Yeah, there's actually so, a plaque yeah. on that wall that says, exactly. like, we don't know where they're from. <laughs> right. Totally. And so that wasn't open to us. And we didn't want to bring in something that was like, even though they're beautiful from like the 25th anniversary or something that was made later, we wanted it very deliberately to be the same flag that anybody could purchase today and hang or wear or use in some way. So, yeah. Can you, so we've got some of the um, yeah. works up here. Yeah. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about how you decided to set the scene? Because we were still going back and forth on the text, like I had some kind of um, idea of what the text would be. But I'm not kidding when I say that really the book was made through her illustrations. It was, um, she had the text as a guidepost, but it sort of changed right up until the end. And it was your work that really gave it's everything life. And so how did you decide, and I'll leave this over here. Sure. And flip the rest I'm going to the microphone. Okay, okay. yeah, we're good. Um, um, maybe here. Yeah. yeah, tell us how you set the scene. Yeah, so living in San Francisco, I walk around and see the flag everywhere. And I think a lot of people see the flag, and then they don't think twice about it, really, because it's it's so prevalent. So I, I thought a lot about not showing the flag as a flag, um, and to try to just sort of symbolize like this flowy, elusive thing that is not like just held or like draped. So the vision for this was just for Gilbert to be the guy who sort of unleashed this concept. So here, he, there's a, we actually had this conversation in a, on a Skype call yeah. where the book designer, who's Amanda Washburn, yeah. she was also like an art editor, very critical person for my process in making the like pieces, like pages to come together. But she was like, can you like add a pole just to make sure that we know that it's a flag still? So I just illustrated him holding like a stick in his hand. But before that, he was just holding like fabric like this. Um, so um, here it's like blowing out. And then I thought it'd be cool to add silhouettes of the parade, in particular the, the bikes on bikes like, at the front, mm -hmm. just to like hint that, that like that's a thing that's part of San Francisco. And I knew that I had to speak to people here who would get it. Keep going. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I yeah, can you tell so the, the first couple of pages here from the book? I think it's lovely. Like, tell us how you decided to come to this kind of history. Yeah, two of my favorite kids are right there. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely looked at the book um, recently. <laughs> Thumbs up with them. <laughs> I actually have a, I, I thought to not put faces on the book for, for characters at all, because that my, my work actually doesn't have a lot of detail on faces, but the editor was like, we, we know children's books, and kids love detail, so you have to put faces on them. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so like, I put like dots for eyes, I just made it very simple. But, but, what I, but my style is also to be very simplistic, so I learned that I could do a lot just by like the way that the lids curve. So major characters, I had them with like two dots, so Barry Argyle has a tie-dye shirt, mm -hmm. and then James McNamara, Mac McNamara, McNamara also has eyes, so they're like looking at you. And Gilbert, I, I, I just love silhouettes of people, like I, I like sort of like stylized depictions of people, so I just wanted him to show adoration at, at his family. And I think for people who identify as queer or gay, wherever on the spectrum, I think that your chosen family is as important as family. So I, I think of just people I love, and like I just wanted him to show that sort of adoration. Yeah. And then for me, it's totally embodied when I see that particular, the, the facial expression and just the way he's clasping his hands. Yeah, I think, like, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I think just Thanksgiving. Like, I think for people who, who can't, go home to, to family that they feel safe around, like we spend Thanksgiving with. So I was actually thinking of Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and like how important it is to have friends around. And it's one of my favorite um, tones of the book is Barry Argyle's uh, tie-dye strip. I really love the way <laughs> he made that happen. Um, it's so beautiful. And we should also say actually, so part of the mama process is fairly uh, tough. I get scared going in front of them. Um, there's the children's book committee, which sounds much nicer than it actually is. I think it would be a really nice meeting. It's not. <laughs> no, they're really wonderful colleagues. They're fantastic. Really, really, there's made up of curators, experts in education, um, publishing. They come from all across uh, the museum, and they know what sells well. Um, what is appropriate for different ages, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so this was possible for them and possible for fine colors. So, but it, it was part of the process of making the book was actually satisfying quite a different um, array of people at the museum. Yeah, I will say that working remotely has an advantage because I have no idea what these meetings go like. And I felt very protected from like all the crossfire, or, like that problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite illustrations. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I wanted to know like where this came from for you because it is one of you. I know it's one of your favorite spots in the book. Yeah, and so if you if this came to you almost immediately, or how this process was of conceptualization. No, to this one took forever. <laughs> um, this is I spent days and sleepless nights sort of obsessing over this one. But I'm glad that Jeff is here because I think we were talking about how like there's this hand map you can use in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. How many of you have like? Use the hand map before. It's a it's a great yeah. tourist trick. Okay, I guess a lot of you haven't, so I'll just repeat it again. But if you like look at this line, it's Market Street, and then this line is like Mission Street. Mm -hmm. So and then this is the Bay Bridge. Mm -hmm. and then this is Golden Gate. So I just love the gouache 
Russian, I use that for a lot of these depictions. So this is another sketch that I had. Um, and this then, is one of yeah, the, the um, one I'll show you is one of my favorites as well. Oh, this one? Yeah. It's great. Should we go out of order? I yeah, it's done. Oh my gosh, yeah, she is great. <laughs> I was wondering if we could go to the main right now. Yeah. <coughs> I just want to scope the story for her quickly. Yeah. So I spent like six weeks. Um, this is what I really needed to do full time. Is like sort of dreaming up what is this book going to look like. Um, when I submitted sample work, it was in the style that the book is in now, which is digital collage. So it's like pictures of fabric that are overlaid with like solid colors. And that's really, I think, what you guys signed off on and yeah. like, sort of expected. So when I sent my storyboard in like watercolor, like I don't, I don't know if people freaked out or not. Oh, I think it's really fine. And then my job always was to be like, it's great. I knew that we were like really doing a lot of magic, fun, so. <laughs> but in general, actually, we had so the publisher, Chris Hudson, is wonderful. Sophie Gola was the coordinator. Yeah, um, and actually. Um, uh, uh, so before that yeah. was wonderful too. So it was a really nice team of people at the moment. It was great. Um, yeah, I'll just go through these quickly and then I can go back to what the finish one looked like. Um, oh yeah, I remember having a Skype call where they were like, we worry that kids think that these um, individuals holding ceremonial flags are on the moon. Can you like add <laughs> more context? And then I was like, okay. <laughs>
and were instrumental in making the design, the sewing, the, the, the making of the, the first flag. And so um, it's not my history at all. And one of the questions I come to is how uh, what enough moment thought it was doing um, writing this history in many ways, or writing a children's book around this history, not writing this history in general. But um, there was a lot of contention over whether we could say that it was Gilbert's idea or whether it was multiple people's idea, how we invited Lynn into the story. And for, I think for both of us, we felt very um, strongly that we should say what we knew, that it was, like most designs, the product of many people's hands. Um, and that it did seem to be, in terms of the historical record, something that Gilbert had really been, you know, really key in terms of conceptualizing, but that um, there had been a of people taking it. So, yeah. yeah, and I think before I knew that history for the book, I just thought a lot about how um, I really didn't want to show, oh, I, I said it earlier that I didn't want to show people's faces, but I just wanted to show hands making the flag, because I, I think I, I, so I was asked early on in the book to at least introduce the character, so then there's the image of like Robert holding his heart, and then Harry holding the cake, so like I was like, okay, I'll introduce the characters there, but then from then on I'm going to try and like zoom out and have you just see the backs of them or just their hands. Yeah. So that kids can sort of, I, I don't think that kids would have benefited from seeing literal, too many literal representations of how I was made. I just yeah. wanted to keep everything symbolic. Yeah. And so we had um, the pictures that you see here. This is Gilbert. Um, he came to the museum in early 2016. We hung the flag. Um, it just so happened it really, really was uh, complete luck. We uh, had to pass it through an acquisitions committee. Every single thing that came into the museum was okay by a committee by 12 people. That happened in mid-June of 2015, and so this was hung on the day that the same-sex marriage um, uh, ruling came down in late June of 2015. And it was, so you see one of my colleagues at MoMA, um, uh, one of the art hunting preparators, hanging the flag. And there was a group that started gathering around it as it was going up, and people started cheering and clapping. It was one of the nicest times I've ever actually had at MoMA. And then there was a couple of people later that day who came, who had just got married at the, um, uh, office and it was they came had that picture taken with it and it became this meeting spot in many ways. You see the Google Maps thing, which is so perfect actually thinking about um, attacking <laughs> and then uh, something like the rainbow flag. But it was within this sort of um, area of the gallery that was dedicated to different symbols. And so yeah, Gilbert came and he talked about um, the making of the flag and brought some of the earliest versions that he had. And then this is when I went to, uh, four years later, I started working at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And so for the 14th anniversary, um, we had the Philly Gate Chorus come and um, sing, and one of the anniversary flags un uh, unfurled by members of the Gilbert Baker Foundation who joined us. And so it was this really wonderful celebration. And again, a lot of people came into this space and said, you know, I feel seen, or I feel like I can identify in this space, I feel um, but it's a message that I, I feel strongly about and I'm glad that it's here. So we hung one of the mass produced flags that you see on the bottom right just there. Um, and then this is part of that story. So it's a good story to explain why MoMA ended up doing this as a book project when it you know, perhaps didn't have this history um, writ large in the rest of its collection. But this gets us back to the spreads count. So talk about what we're looking at here. Um, these were. Um, should I say about them? Well, I guess, well, again, some of my favorite quotes, like they love, um, and it's true, there are flags that have fruits and vegetables on them. We were thinking about the multiplicity of flags, but um, I love the way that you ended up um, uh, showing the cabbages and the Brussels sprites. I don't know if anybody else knows the work of Bruno Minari, the mid-century Italian designer. Do you know Bruno Minari? It's this beautiful echo of a really fantastic Italian designer from the 60s and 70s. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, he made this beautiful book in Mumo in the 1970s where he did the, um, uh, like when you cut a potato and you do the prints with it, he did multiple um, pages just really exploring the possibilities of that as a medium. Um, and so when I saw this, uh, that was my immediate reaction. I was like, oh, it's so Minari. <laughs> I guess it leads me to another one of the questions that we have. When you're looking at the artistic landscape around you, are there specific artists that you've been really inspired by? Are there you know, models for careers or models for aesthetics that you really look at? Yeah, I remember at the time, um, I feel like a lot of people really love her stuff, but I really 
loved Agnes Martin's stuff, and her, she, there's a Agnes Martin Chapel mm -hmm. at SF MoMA, and her stuff is like the, the color tones are very similar to mine. Like it's like pastel pinks, pastel blues, like very detailed, like subtle work. But in making the book, I just really like um, a lot of my previous portfolio was just based on work that I like saw on Instagram, and like there are some illustrators out there that I really love. Called, like, Monica Garwood is one someone in San Francisco that I really like. Um, Blanca Gomez, who I think did a book, maybe did a month of book, or did a book that was sold at the store. Um, I did a, oh, Charlotte Auger is another person mm -hmm. whose work I really love, but I wasn't looking at their work as I was making the book. I just really made stuff that I felt happy making, so like, this is a very deep, but like making like broccoli and like ridicule was just fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, when am I gonna make broccoli? I could make when am I gonna go send you this Munari book? <laughs> and maybe like that will be a book that you make in response to it. I feel like that's what you're going on here. I'm glad you didn't even know that because you didn't see this book in the diary. Yeah, so a lot of this, I, I also, there, there isn't a lot of mention of the trans community in the book, so I thought that this was the perfect place to put the flag, yeah. and that people would also get that. And then I also wanted to include a lot of skin tones. In fact, I wanted to make Gilbert Baker and his friend circle like darker skin tones, but I got pushed back because there, the museum was like, these people are real, you have to be yeah, accurate, because you have to sort of like do justice to his history, basically, because I wanted to take a lot of license. Which yes. I think is a good thing in my life. <laughs> yeah, no, there was a, um, a a moment at which actually the children's book community was like, yeah, well, there's a history here as well. Yeah, I, you can go ahead. Oh, I, I just think that was important to respect. But I also appreciated that we have we had a conversation about it. I guess that leads me to another question that we have on our list, which is, um, it's an unusual book. I think. I mean, I. This is not a community that I identify with as being a member of. And so we talked a lot about who gets to tell stories, especially at um, MoMA, where it is a space that corporatizes art a lot of the time, where there are, I think, museums in general. No, I won't make generalization. It's actually a city in a really welcoming museum. Many museums, though, are spaces of exclusivity rather than inclusivity. And so I guess one of the questions that we talked about a bit, but you know, maybe not as often as we might have because moment to moment, is what did you feel about this story being told, like me writing the text, or Mama being the institution for it? Like how did that sit with you? I, I wonder if you had some sort of like um, history or like personal relationship with the gay community or the queer community to yeah. like just to sort of champion this project. Michelle, by the way, pushed for this book for two years straight and is not getting paid for any of any no. any of the book. No. Like, but it goes you know, it, but it does it goes all of the proceeds that I would have gotten, which I, I asked actually tonight out of Sophie, I was like, how many books have we sold? And so we'll find out in one day. But um, yeah, no, I, um, I, I, I did not get paid for this. Yeah, but. so I mean, just knowing that really blows me away because I think, I think for, and it's, I, I really <coughs> spoke early on for like art projects, I think you need, you need someone in a position to bring people who cannot say their story. Like, if you think about people of color who are now directing movies with greater frequency now and we're getting budgets from big studios, like, there's someone there who's probably not in that community who is choosing this director to do this work. And I think in order for, for art to become more integrated, we need people who have different levels of access to open the doors for other people. I so, think that's true. And then sort of, in a way, um, learn when to step aside. Like, I think um, I see a change in terms of the staffing of the museums in which I work, where there is a move towards um, welcoming in a diversity of voices, not just in terms of what's shown on the walls, but actually in terms of the staff, because that's where it's critical. If you have people who get to make the choices about what is <coughs> acquired and what stories are told, then you have a much more sustainable uh, type of diversity than you do in, in if there are just the same gatekeepers choosing a slightly different lineup to put on the walls. 
And so I think that um, it's a question I continually ask because I think it's good in a way to have uh, folks who are interested in supporting different stories, pushing them forward. But I think the hope, in the end, um, they end up moving quite quite drastically. Like. Yeah, I think that like for for someone who had never done a book before, first that was like the first sort of big story opportunity to me is that the museum of this size would sort of choose someone without just just took that risk and chose someone who had no book, like pre prior experience with this. Um, and then in terms of like telling a story that wasn't necessarily mine, I, I think that we can only own our own experiences. So like, I think that storytellers, we can only respect a storyteller because they're telling their side of the story. So I didn't feel entitled to like tell the story at all, except that like I lived in San Francisco for 10 years and I and I came out after, after moving here. So like I felt like I had a story to say and it's not everybody's story, but I definitely thought that my voice was just important. Yeah. And it's hard to feel that too, like as, a, as, as someone who like, to, to feel like you really have something to say and that other people should care about it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's um, I guess I'm going to ask one more question and then um, we'll open it up to the audience. Um, what do you want your next project to be? Uh, it's been, this book took so much out of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> they tend to. <laughs> yeah, I, I never would have thought, like, I feel like drained, but in a very rewarded, rewarded way. So, like, I, I hope to, like, something that has always fascinated me is just dance and movement. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think, I, I, I just love thinking about movement and depicting um, change. So, like, I don't know what that looks like, but I think a lot of artists, like, find one thing that they obsess over, and then they do it for, like, 10 years. But I think that, like, I, I love, I still love static images. I'm sort of interested in video. Um, but I think it'd be really cool to see how do I depict, like, sort of fluidity and motion through, like, still images. So that's something I'm thinking of. I can think of tons of images. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, on my children's book, for example, on the history of performance in France. Mm -hmm. It's all painters, sculptors, and it's a designer, but that's a great thing. Well, yeah, but, uh, a lot of the work that you discovered was about dance. And yeah. Like, great. Well, then. <laughs> 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 well, we should open it up to any questions that people might have. We really would welcome them. <coughs> or we can also. Um, I can keep going through slides. Yeah, yeah. 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 How did you meet Gilbert? I didn't. He passed away. I think um, he's in twenty twenty seventeen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And not. I love that you have the astronaut. So that was <laughs> thing. Yeah. This is perfect. When this final page came through, I was like, yeah, <laughs> so good. Yeah. I just think it's so evocative and beautiful. And I feel that it says he really um, was inspired by the bicentennial in nineteen seventy six. He made the flag in seventy eight, but he said these flags were American flags were all over the place during the seventy six bicentennial. And so the first two flags that um, they made as a group in 78, actually one of them had a corner uh, that had tiger stars on it. Um, and so they, they very deliberately were looking at the American flag in the case, which I really love because it's such a contentious um, design in and of itself. Um, they also were looking at the work of Jasper Johns and the Neo movement and the sort of recombination of the flag in the 50s and 60s through painting. Um, but I, I love that this sort of co-opted this flag that you know purports to stand for everybody, doesn't so often stand for everybody, sometimes does, but they took part of it themselves and made it for them. I'm, I'm glad you shared that story because I think that reminds me that the first sort of image that I thought for this illustration was like Gilbert watching TV or having a TV around and just seeing flags yeah. everywhere. But then like I just sort of like thought it'd be cooler to to sort of bring kids to like some to just like anywhere other than TV. <laughs> 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 that was parents. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was like, the moon is great. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, this scene was like really hard for me to illustrate because I'm not used to doing crowns <clears> at all. <throat> so um, I, I had several conversations with the, the book designer, and um, I actually have like pictures of what these. So I'll do a lot of clicking again. But those were the spreads that probably took the longest to come together, um, just because I'm used to showing like individuals. So 
this was like one, this was like the first sketch that I sent out. And I talked with Amanda about this and was like, I, I actually like have some ideas. She was like, well, I like the silhouette that you did in the beginning. And you actually add that motif back and have the silhouettes like all sort of like a grayscale. Um, and then just go with that. And I was like, okay. So like, I sort of like tried this. Um, and then she was, and then we had more conversations about making a scale. And um, in, in the book, you'll see like they're, they're just sort of gray images with, where the signs were featured. Um, and I'll just go through a few of these quickly. This, with the authorship, we like. Um, have three characters in yeah. instead of the two. Yeah. So we have um, Gilbert and Ferry and uh, James McNamara sitting on his two on Grave Streets, dreaming of what the um, rainbow flag will be. But in the text, very definitely said it's Gilbert who had this sort of brainwave. Um, and apparently, actually, the story goes that um, there was a moment on the for the disco way he may or may not have been under the influence of things that couldn't be in a children's book. But <laughs> <laughs> that idea came to him, and so I think we used to, uh, he took some license with the words in that point, and said that it was this moment in time that, I you know, like the colors of the disco. <laughs> 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 but he didn't include some of the, like, finding the details of that moment. Um, and so, yeah, that's what's in there. I love that. <laughs> Dressed in drag sometimes and like so sequin dresses for himself. I was like, this is so great that I get to throw this in a children's book. Yeah. Um, but I definitely like couldn't go all out. I just like toned it down a little bit. <laughs> Although I think actually I will say that when we um, were looking over the uh, text for the book, it was incredibly important to be explicit and direct and historically accurate about the um, identities of um, the main protagonists, for example, and the, to, to use the, um, uh, the exact language that they would have used themselves to identify, and to make sure that that wasn't in any way mitigated, changed, or otherwise, um, you know, yeah, in, in no way changed. And so that was actually something the Children's Book Committee were extremely direct about as well, saying that that's an important part of this book, and indeed it's part of the, um, the reason for this book. So, um, just keep going through it. Uh, this one was one of my favorites to make. Um, this is where I sort of thought it'd be more fun to just show, to give kids a top view, because I think most kids, as they're moving through the world, just have to look up to people and they see like their legs because they're just like hugging them. Like I imagine like kids just not getting a top view of things. So I thought as as much as possible just zoom out of it and let them see like things that they don't normally get to see. Um, this is also one of my favorites. I think they they uh, I remember talking to the book editor and she was like, wow, like this is I, I had pictured like maybe like people like running or like carrying fabric through, but I was like how how relatable is it like the sort of like purgatory of like waiting for your laundry <laughs> to dry? <drive? laughs> and I felt like this spoke to the too. Yeah. And I think um, a lot of people who live in big cities, especially San Francisco, like a lot of us don't have laundry <laughs> machines. So I think it was really important to just show a laundromat for for how the, the fabrics were set with their dyes. Yeah. And my friends my friend suggested that they would have been angrily thrown out of the laundry bag. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't the story, actually, so we can read you the exact line. But um, Gilbert said that they were um, the laundromat runner was extremely mad because you weren't allowed to dry things. You could only wash and then dry. And so, um, yeah, the Gilbert and Mary thought it was exciting, but the owner was less than thrilled. They had to grab the fabric and run away. They could be still trading blue colored cloth behind them. The next day, a few customers found that their underwear had mysteriously turned rose pink, blue, purple, and princess red. <laughs> so, yeah, they were. They, they, the um, story that they were told was that they were not welcome in that little ever again. So, yeah. <laughs> and for the flow of the book, I wanted to see, like, so in the previous spread, you see that like, still again the theme of like having a flag not look like a flag. Like, so here you just see dyes, and then here you just see the dyes like sort of. It's, it's all building up to like the reveal. Um, and here it's still like, not quite a flag. It's like billowing out of the building and then people, like, I, I knew historically that the flag was so big it needed multiple hands to run through the sewing machine. So I wanted to 
capture that, and then this later became the cover of the book. Uh, and this is also one of the two sample illustrations that I that I provided, which eventually helped me to get picked later. Yeah. So I think people like I think the committee seemed to really like this. But, I mean, I picked two questions, so I didn't ask anyone else to sample illustrations. I think so. This is great. <laughs> and then here I still didn't want to show it as a flag, um, but I have it just sort of like revealing itself to, to, to people of different skin tones, and I got to echo the idea of a rainbow just going to people overhead and people being like, awed by it. And here, I also am not focusing on the characters, I'm just showing like, the thing that they're holding, and then the same theme of like, silhouettes is in the background. So I, I've always wanted the flag to be the main character, that's why it has the most color, that's why it has the most texture, that's why people have sort of secondary um, textures to them. Like fairy needed a detail, enough detail for you to know that it was fairy. Um, that was something I learned in making the book, was that like being consistent with how you depict people and characters is extremely important. So that was something I sort of learned on the fly. And a sense of visual hierarchy is also really important. Uh, so here, like you see that, again, like the first thing I wanted you to see was the flag and the second the people. Here, I wanted you to see the flag first and think about the rest of the details. And then here, this is actually on video on the display where you can see that the, like, the makers, I uh, like guess the leaders of the flag making, hold, hold it up in the air, and there was this beautiful moment of how the flag caught a wind, and then like there was a sun, like, sun in the back, and then the colors were translucent, and it sort of like glowed. Um, so that picture, I think, is really beautiful. I don't know that this fully captures it. I actually thought that the storyboard did that better because I used watercolor. But I'm still very happy with it. No, I really love it. I feel like the texture on this really, really beautifully modulates the color. Yeah, I think the collage worked well. We even had a conversation about whether kids would get the viewfinder. I actually had like a little plus in the center, but we decided to just keep like the like crops, um, the, the little squares on the outside. And then this is where it really hung up MoMA until new MoMA happened. Um, but uh, this was the lobby at MoMA, and it was the first thing that almost everybody saw as they came into the museum, and I hope all we become is part of the MoMA, um, although there are now many more entry points. But it overlooked the um, garden, and without fail, people came in and would get that picture taken by it, they would stop, and almost no one knew, and this is why I love design history, because you know the clothes that we wear, the chairs that we sit on, the cars or the other forms of travel, everything in our lives is shaped by design. Um, there's absolutely no way of getting around it. You cannot see a painting for 10 years. You can, you know, in, 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 in any other mode of the virtual production, you can avoid it if you really want to, but you cannot with design. And I loved the fact that people came in, saw this, and then read about a history that they really had no idea about at all, and started to think about something that was very different in a different way. So, yeah, this is where it was. Yeah, and I wanted to also preach, like, depict Civic Center and how cool it was to have the lights on display, which they do every June, and it's really exciting to me. So I wanted to bring it back to San Francisco, and then these are more pictures of the storyboard, which I can just put really quickly. Um, <laughs> And you'll see, like I, I used Gilbert's hands as being very dark skin tone, but then I um, <laughs> changed the tone later. Um, this is the bicentennial and the astronaut. This is um, I, I really like this one, but I think it just couldn't. It, I, I didn't know how to give that same effect through collage, which is just harder and more flat. Um, Protest scenes. Oh, this was the original like reveal because I wanted it to be a van to be like more clearly a flag, but then I thought it'd be better to have it wave um, sort of diagonally across the page. So this is a storyboard version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful to see how like, the essence is there, but it's the time and the like we're moving towards the final. And um, Oh, I remember showing my friends some images of like the, the storyboard and towards the end I had a hard time depicting buildings because like architecture is just also not something that I'm experienced with and then 
she asked me, she was like, so what do you have left to do? And I was like, oh, I need to work on architecture. She was like, what does that mean? Is that like architect, like metaphorically? I was like, no, it's like literally building. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.